Amen. And uh, I was talking to my wife. I was talking to my wife, and uh, and she asked me, "Where are you in your lesson?" Amen. I, uh, she said, how long have you been there? <laughs> I said, a long time. But uh, there are so many things in the book of Acts that really, if we do not pay attention to them and uh, proclaim them more than anything, it, uh, we are doing this service to him that wrote the book and inspired these people to write these things. And it, it is not for us to determine in any particular way what is good, what's bad, or different. God is the one that is in control. Yeah. And I don't think that I will ever uh, get off the soapbox to say that God is in control. Man. There is there is nothing anybody can say that uh, is going to alter that uh, that order that procedure that uh, the way that things have been uh, established things that have been uh, ordained, if you will. So it, it is to me a very very very. Uh, difficult time to pass on without saying what I think I need to say. Amen. Not that I, not that my words have anything good in them. No. I am trying to convey to you what God is trying to tell us for His glory and for His pleasure. I was I, I am reading this book that Brother Jack has uh, said so many times that we need to read the attributes of God. It's amazing. Yeah. It, it is something that really you cannot put it down. And on top of that, it's not that only you cannot put it down, it's that you cannot pass on. You read something, I say, is that what he said? And you begin to penetrate, if you will, the, 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 uh, that material, that, that thing that God is, and you begin to absorb the Amen. things that he wants you to know. I was in the beginning, it says, uh, God has an infinite mind. An infinite mind is the only one that is capable of having millions of pursuance to his attention. Millions. And each one of us is an individual that God and listen to us when we ask attention from him. Amen. Now, how do you how do you get that? It's only one way. God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. God is God. Amen. Let's not lose that. Because if we begin to think the way we do, we lose it. I tell people that believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I also do. I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Paul does say, seek the, the gifts. But seek one in particular, and that is prophesying. Prophesying means that you are going to use your words, 
the ones that God had put in your brain, that when He wants to use them, He used your mouth to take them out and let somebody else hear that. Amen. I, I, it, 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 it is so hard for me to, to avoid that. Because that is the... Why are we here? I <laughs> think says, do you know that God doesn't gain anything out of you? Even when you are worshiping Him, He doesn't gain anything. God is perfect in everything. And we are here trying to show that we are doing God a favor. Mm. Because you're sitting down on Sunday school listening to this guy of the third world country that doesn't speak English well, but he is trying to tell you something. Something that God has revealed to him and we need to heed those words. Those, that, 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 I, I believe that uh, I was in a, in a mission conference when Brother Austin was here. He says, come and hear. Come and heed. Come and get it. And, 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 and I, all, all those things, it, they seem to just to be just so trivial, but it's not. We need to pay attention. And God is that kind of a God that demands that from us. Not that he gets anything out of it. But he demands. He, he says, you, you, you do that. Now whether I like it or I don't like it or it's different, you do it. Because that's, we, are, uh, we are his subjects. And that's another thing. How do you call people in the United States? We call them citizens. And we are. How do you call people in England? They're not citizens. They're subjects. And the subject is supposed to do what the king says. It is not a whim or a thing, no. We in America are so far removed from that type of thinking, that type of ideology. You see, the English people, because they understand what it is to have a king and a queen, they understand much better what Jesus is trying to tell us. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the omnipotent God that we dare not obey Him. That's bad. Now, I was, uh, I, I'm sure that you have seen movies. And have you ever seen that movie, uh, Braveheart? Now, what makes those people in the conditions that they were in the terrible terrible situation that they were involved to be loyal to their king why can't we be that way mm -hmm. amen we need to be conscious of what God is. The way that that soldier was, I mean, charging with his saber open and bled, bleeding all over the place. Why? Because there was something burning in his heart and that was the love for his king. When are we going to understand that that is our job. We need to address that, not to somebody else, but to ourselves. Get yourself in front of the mirror and say, why don't you worship God the way he is? 
And then you want to start getting into the idea of the things that you do are because God is in control. He lets you move around, he lets you put up and put down because he is merciful. Just think of something. When you pass a red light, what happens behind you? They get you. When you are insulting, when you are attacking, when you are misbehaving in front of God, why he doesn't come up with that siren and strike you there? Why not? His grace, his mercy, his love. He really loves us. We don't think so because we don't get the things on time as our time could be. But he does love us. Every page of scripture, no matter where you open, you can see God's love towards the people that he is the king of. So, uh, this, is, this is just uh, the things that I have, I've been going through this, this week. It, 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 is, it is heavy on me. And uh, it is heavy because we are, uh, we are very, very uh, complacent. We don't care. Or we do not realize that God is God and He is the one that needs to be worshipped and He is the God that is controlling our lives. Okay, so don't take it against me. Take it with God. He is the one that tells you to say these things. And uh, we have in this book of Acts, such a beautiful, beautiful rendition of not the history of Israel, not the history of the world, not the history really of the church, but the history of two people. Two men that were solely given to the declaration of God's will. Peter and Paul are something to behold. And uh, I don't know why, but this just came into my mind. And I'm going to ask you a favor. If you are interested in watching a movie, it is very long. It's over three hours long. And uh, it will tell you what I am telling you in so many words over here as we study the book of Acts. This book of Acts, the rendition of the book of Paul, yes, God bless you. And uh, this, this thing of, uh, uh, of Peter and Paul, I would like to know if you seriously want to watch it. If you don't, you are not hurting my feelings. All I want to know is if I can show it to, to, to you at night, uh, and it's going to be, I believe, on a Thursday or a Friday night. Away from everything that you have normally do, and uh, if you want to, please let me know. Just get a little bit of the toilet paper, right? It says Thursday or Friday or whatever, so the paper will not go will not uh, uh, cost you or anything, uh, just the effort to tell me when would you like to have this movie and then we can come over here and we watch it. And you are going to be blessed by this movie because it is the life of Peter and Paul. So that is my commercial for today. But. 
when we see Peter and Paul acting, and when we read them in the pages of Scripture, it is, it is telling us one thing. One thing tells us that Christianity, as we know it, has a starting point. That starting point is Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, we do not have Christianity. We may have uh, other type of religions, and that's all they will be. They will be religions. Men made stuff to get you at your feelings, to get you and manipulate you in a way that they want. So this is something else. Christianity, actually, we are the only ones that have a God that is alive. Amen. He is alive. He is the one that controls us the way we know how things are. You talk about Confucius or Allah or whoever, they did and they're still in the, in the grave. Peter says over here in the book of Acts that he is talking about David. And he said, he's dead. And he's buried. And his bones are still with us. These other deities that they are elevated to deity by the workings of men are dead. They're like the, in the Catholic Church. We have statues that have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, and they don't hear. They have feet, and they don't walk. They have hands, and they don't do anything. They are just there. But our God is moving in our midst. Amen. Now, how, how can you top that off? You can't. So, Christianity is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has made it a requirement to be a Christian. You have to be like him. So when we begin to understand this, salvation is not what all the people say. It is not a legalist. It is not a ritualist. It is not a moralist. It is not a universalist. It is Jesus Christ. And as Jesus tells us, there is only one way to God, and that's through Him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, this situation where salvation is the only way to God, nobody else has it. And the devil, as I told you last week, is trying the dead little best to muscle, mungle it up and make a mess out of it to make people understand what some person might tell you, some person might teach you, some person might influence you in one way or another. But that is not Christianity. Christianity is Jesus. And Jesus needs to be obeyed. And Jesus needs to be worshipped. And Jesus needs to be held in prime steam. Man. Nobody else can do that by us. We have to do that to him. We have to make him understand that he is up there. Nobody understands that. But we do. And we need to be up there. So, it is salvation to most people have different, different ideas, and we are not 
supposed to do what the people do, we are supposed to do what God says. We have been established by God. And this God is the one that is going to take us wherever he wants to go. So, one thing that I want you to notice, just perhaps the last time, these other salvations that you have heard and people try to push it on you, none of them have the word God in them. They all have works of men. Where ways of people how people think things should be. But they do not have God's business at hand. They don't. So we are living in a world that you can say it is secular. And this secular world may very well adopt any of those things that we have said. We have said. But we are living also in this world that God created. And as we know that God is a creator, everything that is in creation is superseded by his will. So whatever he wills, that's what he's going to do. His will is extremely clear. I don't understand how people say, I don't know what the will of God is. Have you ever gone to John chapter 6 and tells you at 639, it tells you exactly what the will of God is. Okay, just for the heck of it, we are going to read it. John chapter 6, verse 39, I think. I don't know why anybody cannot see that. Now why watch on the room? Now, have you ever read that before? And this is the Father's will. Now, can you not understand that? Is there the possibility of another interpretation? Can you interpret that? And this is the Father's will which had sent me that all of which he had given me I should lose nothing but should raise it up in the last day. Verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me. I mean, he has said twice in two verses that is the will of God. Why can you see that? The will that sent me that everyone who seeth the Son and believe on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up in the last day. So the will of God is that we need to listen to Jesus. Now I is there any interpretation? Can anybody give me another interpretation of that? I don't think you can. You cannot think better than God. In Isaiah, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So don't, don't mess with me. Just listen and do it. Amen. So, his way of salvation it becomes to us a gift from God. A gift that is preceded by the faith that God gives you so that you can believe what he says. And when you understand what God says, then what is the problem? Which part you don't get it? God said it, and that sells it. 
It is not whether you like it or not. It is whether you, will you believe it or not. You are nothing. All you have to do is obey God and do His will. Because He is the way, the truth and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by Him. So that is our salvation, and that is our uh, that is the thing that Peter was preaching on Pentecost. There is no other way. And this new Peter that we have over here is a uh, demonstration, if you will, of what God can do with somebody that has given himself to the will of God. We have Peter over here telling us what God is doing. And in the appeal that we have from Peter, it is amazing how you cannot get away from it. But the appeal is that, hey, you people, you kill the Messiah. You are not giving God his due. So, there are people that have problems understanding this, and uh, when they do not understand, they go and they do their own thing. So, the first thing that they do is uh, try to change the words. Don't change the words. The, Peter, the, the, the sermon that Peter preached, I went and I was reading Mr. Spurgeon. He's amazing. That's another one that I don't know how, how people are so gifted so that they can write down these things, you know. And we have, Spurgeon says that Peter's sermon was not a display of eloquence. Yeah. It was not. It, neither was the sermon of Peter a plea of, uh, of emptiness like, a, hey, believe, believe. No. The, Peter, the, the sermon that Peter preached was or a lay on who he was. Peter was not a bright person. He became bright and to us eloquent when he is doing what God says. And, and, and the truthfulness of his preaching, it's amazing because he didn't have those words. Those words were given by the Holy Spirit. He appealed to a scripture, a scripture that I believe he had one time read it, and he put it in his brain, and the Holy Spirit just put it out. Just like it says in John chapter 14, verse 26, that God is going to recall, or remind you, is going to teach you the things that is going to be taken out of your brain so that you can do what they what these things are. So, he didn't know anything. I, I, I don't believe that he really memorized the scripture. But at the day of Pentecost, Peter quoted Joel chapter 2 from verse 8 to verse 14, 18. So this made the people that were with him cooperate with him. They were, they were probably not believing the things that were coming out of his mouth. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? I hope you do. Because that is what happened to Peter when he talked in the day of Pentecost. They were coming out words that they were deep inside and only the gift of the Holy Spirit is the one that is going to bring them forth. 
is going to one that are going to be usable. So his brother cooperating with him, and Mr. Spurgeon says, and his son evident zeal of faith must have been astonishing. Now that's what Spurgeon says. And what is Spurgeon known as? Spurgeon is known as the prince of preachers. Amazing. And he tells that Peter over here was completely given to the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit wanted done. Amen. He opened the ears of people to hear what they needed to hear. They opened their mouth to people that needed to enunciate those words that can come in into your brain and stay there because they are from God. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And when they do all that, then we can come to the part of the end where it says, when they assimilated this, verse 41 says, then they that gladly receive, notice there is a, a, a situation where you need to agree, it says, then they that gladly receive his word were baptized. It is not what people of the Kabbalites say that in verse 38, that you are going to be baptized for the remission of your sins. It does say that, but they do not understand it. They were saved first. Amen. They agree with the word. They did what the, the word says. Then they were forgiving of their sins. And then they were baptized. Because they believed what God said. And the same day, they were gathered unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continue. Now, we are going to have that opportunity next week. He says over here, I, do you see how God can correlate and orchestrate this beautiful situation? Where we are going to have this thing that you be yourself are going to be used of God going to be used of God in that fellowship that we are going to have because it says over here in the Bible and they continue steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and breaking bread and in prayers we are going to have that next week we are going to have fellowship, we are going to have food, we are going to have the opportunity of giving a blessing to somebody because when they see you